I've always been open-minded about the supernatural, and I enjoy a good ghost story as much as the next person. The following is an account of something that I experienced a little over 20 years ago in County Dublin in the Republic of Ireland. I've had very little experience with what we called supernatural phenomena, but this one has stayed with me and left me wondering about what I experienced. The girl I was seeing at the time gave me a call to let me know that her parents would be out of town for the weekend and that I was more than welcome to spend the weekend alone with her in her parents' house. Now being a teenage boy, I naturally didn't need to be asked twice. And before I knew it, we were cuddling away in a bedroom. It wasn't long, however, until our passion was interrupted by the distinct sound of footsteps coming up the stairs. On hearing the footsteps, I immediately leapt up and said something along the lines of, what the fuck, I thought your parents were gone for the weekend. She assured me that they were indeed gone for the weekend and seemed to brush off the fact that we both clearly heard heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. Strange things continued to happen throughout the day, such as once when walking by a room to get to the bathroom, I couldn't help but notice that all the windows had been opened and that the curtains were blowing around like they were in a hurricane. The thing is, I could have sworn that those windows were shut the first time I passed them, but who knows? Maybe I was mistaken. In fact, I wasn't really feeling spooked by any of this, and just told myself that what I'd witnessed could have been the result of any number of things. It wasn't long until I was actually freaked out though. At some time in the middle of the night, both myself and my girlfriend woke up, and I remember asking what the hell was going on. I had a feeling I can't quite describe, sort of a mixture of dread and despair, with a hint of curiosity if that makes any sense. I could hear movement downstairs, and I had the distinct feeling that there was a crowd of God knows what below in the kitchen. I could also hear conversations, but couldn't make out what was being said. I again asked my girlfriend what the hell was going on in this house, and to my surprise, she calmly told me that this type of thing is always happening. This didn't exactly reassure me, but I managed to get back to sleep without further incident. Now one more thing I'd like to add is that the house in question was a terraced house and that the house next door had been not too long before the scene of a murder. From what I remember in the news, a woman had been brutally killed but no one ever been convicted. Everybody was convinced that it was the husband, but I think he got off on a technicality. I've often wondered if this had anything to do with some of the strange things I experienced. So I can't pinpoint the exact year I heard this dream, but I think it was around the time I was 17 or 18. Anyways, in my dream I was older than I was when I had the dream. I'm not sure exactly how old, but I worked at a cafe with seven other employees. It was three men, four counting me, and three women. We were super close friends, and I'm talking like taking turns going to each other's houses for the holidays. I don't know how to explain how I knew that, but I just felt deep levels of familial love and connection. It ended abruptly, but waking up I felt grief, like I actually lost those people. It kind of messed me up for like two days. But I was too embarrassed to explain to anyone why I was upset. I mean, what was I supposed to say? I'm upset that people don't go to see my dream friends anymore. That being said, I forgot about this experience until about four to five years later when a good friend of mine asked me to pick up a shift at a cafe he worked at. I of course told him no, no problem, plus I wasn't working that day, so the extra cash was a nice incentive. This is where it gets wild. When I got there, I met the owner, but I didn't recognize him at first until the other workers got there. But seeing them together, the exact number of women, exact number of men, plus, of course, I recognized their faces. I completely froze and my heart dropped into my stomach. They were no doubt the people from the dream. Memories of that dream instantly flooded back and I honestly don't know how I carried on throughout the day. I felt like crying and throwing up, but I just kept my mouth shut, not wanting to seem crazy. Since that day, my buddy hasn't needed me to fill in for him 
I never built up the courage to go back, even as a customer. So when I was little, I lived in Grays Harbor in Washington State, more specifically Cosmopolitan Washington. And my aunt and her three kids lived in the next town over, Aberdeen, Washington. So I lived with my mom and brother until I was seven and a half or eight, and then I moved in with my grandparents. The story happened throughout a period of six or so years. Anyway, my aunt is a hairdresser and this house that she had moved into had a space in the back big enough to have her own little salon type area. This house was a one story, three bedroom house with one bathroom. My other aunt and her two children lived across the street from her. And her oldest, I'm not gonna disclose my cousin's names, so I'll use other names for this. My cousin Tina would babysit her younger brother, Auntie Mo's kids, and myself basically any time the adults need a time out from us. And because Mo's house was the biggest and most convenient, that's why we would stay till the parents came home. Backstory of the house. The house was owned by a man who lived by himself and had been alone for a long time after his wife had passed away. He had passed away in his closet and was found after concerned neighbors went to check on him after not seeing him around for a while. It took years for the house to finally get sold, the buyer being my aunt. For the first few months of being in the house, there didn't seem to be any problems until my aunt started to renovate the back room for her salon. Her oldest son, Joe, had gotten up to use the bathroom in the middle of the night and the sink started to turn on and off over and over by itself. This had scared him so bad that he didn't want to use the bathroom by himself anymore. But that was just the beginning. Soon, you could hear heavy boot steps up in the attic overhead and things started to move on their own. The dog would constantly freak out and bark at what seemed to be nothing. We constantly felt someone touching our heads, almost like getting a pat on the top of your head from your parents or adult family members or friends. There was one occurrence that really stuck with me though. It was the middle of winter and Teeny was babysitting the other kids and me. About an hour after the parents had left, the dog was in the laundry room and the door was shut and locked because the door on the other side of the laundry room went to the backyard outside. The dog started to just freak out when the door to the laundry room flew open violently and all of us kids screamed. Tina ran to the door, closed it and re-looked it and quickly ran back into the living room where the rest of us were. And no sooner than she got there, the sound of the door lock unlocking was heard and the door flew open a second time. This happened several times in a row and the dog was just going crazy at this point. So Tina went and got the dog out of the kennel in the laundry room and we all went across the street to her house. For the rest of the time our parents were out. Aunt Mo's kids didn't want to go home that night. This was by far the scariest time I had that house. But so many other things had happened as well. My mom had a really freaky thing happen there. When she was pregnant with my little brother, she was sleeping in my aunt's bed with my brother's father, Rick. Rick had woken up in the middle of the night to the spirit of the man at the end of the bed just staring at him and my mom sleeping. He woke up my mom pointing at the spirit and all she did was look at the spirit. Then Rick, just telling Rick, so what, he's just curious to who is in this house. Just go back to sleep and ignore him. He's not going to hurt you. Rick, however, got up and got out of the house as fast as he could and would never enter that house again for any reason whatsoever. I lived with my grandma and grandpa from the age of eight to 14. So my grandma collected dolls of all kinds and kept them in the guest bedroom. She had over a hundred dolls a lot of them being porcelain. But some of the dolls were old, unsavory looking dolls. And one, the one that creeped me out most, was one of those ventriloquist dolls, basically the same one featured on Goosebumps. Anyway, my bedroom was right next to the guest bedroom. And when I first moved in, 
I was not really bothered by the dolls, maybe because I was younger and always distracted by other things. As I got older, I started to get a really bad feeling from that room and would start shutting the guest room at night because when I had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I would have to look at the room coming back. But when I did eventually get up to go to the bathroom, the door wouldn't be open, knowing full well I had closed it before I went to bed. And I, grandparents claimed, to not be responsible. When I was 12, one of my grandma's friends had passed away and she had taken a lock of hair from that friend, now dead, and attached it to the head of one of her oldest dolls. Soon after, I started to hear voices coming from that room at night. And every time I would go past the room and peek in, I felt all the eyes of the dolls were staring straight into my soul. When I turned 13, I started to get really bad nightmares and would wake up in the bed shaking. I would jump out of bed and it would continue to shake. And I would be too much of a chicken to wake my grandparents up to tell them about it. Because their answer to everything is to pray for deliverance and ask God to cast away the nightmares because the only kind of spirit is the Holy Spirit. These episodes of bed shaking and constant voices coming from the doll room never stopped, but the last straw for me was the black shadow that would fly across my room. So I started to always sleep with something over my eyes and still do to this day. I ended up moving in with my aunt and after it had gotten to the point of me not wanting to go to my room at all, I'm terrified of dolls to this day. They're evil bastards. My boyfriend and I have had some weird things happen while we've lived here, but this is by far the strangest. Some of the things we've experienced are drawers in the kitchen slowly open by themselves. My boyfriend's dad even gets frustrated with it because there's no explanation as to why it's happening. We sometimes struggle to open them ourselves. Weird unexplained sounds such as objects falling while all the pets are with us and then being unable to find the source. My boyfriend's dad hears what sounds like a pile of clothes hangers falling in the kitchen late at night while home alone with the pets and then going to check but nothing is there. My boyfriend's brother heard banging in the garage just for us to find nothing there. My boyfriend and I heard a low muffled growling right next to us late at night while playing video games. After we heard the growling, we were pretty freaked out because all of the animals were at the opposite end of the house and everyone was asleep. We decided to brush it off and keep playing so we didn't scare ourselves thinking about it. And this time, my boyfriend and I were once again playing video games in our room and we randomly heard a long loud drawn out howl coming from the hallway right outside our room. The dogs started freaking out and we could hear them running towards the area. Then my boyfriend's dad came in and said, wow, you really freaked the dogs out with that. But when he saw our startled faces, he was like, that wasn't you. My boyfriend and his dad went outside to check just in case it was a coyote, but there were no footprints in the snow by the area where we heard it. It sounded the clearest day right inside the house. I'm super freaked out and I have no clue what it could have been. So I live in a two bedroom apartment with my friend. We both make music and have a makeshift setup for recording vocals in one of the bedrooms. In the midst of one of these sessions, he was on the mic with headphones on and I was at the computer engineering him. I hit record and almost immediately heard a sound behind me, like a muffled female's voice. It startled me, but I wouldn't have thought about it very hard had it not been for my friend who, with studio headphones on playing the beat, quickly turned around and looked behind him. We then locked eyes and he asked me if I heard it too. We walked around the apartment and found no one that could have made the sound. My girlfriend was asleep in the other room. I woke her up and asked if she'd said something. She didn't. We went back to the computer and realized we were recording when it happened. 
So we played it back and heard it again. Almost like someone saying hello from the corner of the room. It had to be three to four years ago this happened, maybe a little longer. But the fear I had that day, I still remember. I believe I was sharing the room with a family member and I was tired, sleeping on one side of the bed, my feet near the door. So I knocked out, feel okay. Then I woke up sometime in the middle of the night. It had to be a dream that woke me up that night. I wished I remembered. Usually nowadays, when I'm about to go to sleep in my room, it's when I hear noises, heavy noises, hot and cold sensations, and a few more. What I will say is, I know when they're around. I woke up in my sleep, breathing heavily, so I moved my feet to the side end of the bed. Since my bed was sideways at the time, I believed vertical to the wall. And then I felt it. At first I thought, okay, maybe this is my mom, or another family member. But the thing was, most of my family members were asleep. If it was them, they probably would have woke me up in my sleep or wanted something. Anyway, I kicked it and it felt hard. I probably should mention the cover was over my head, but I just felt like something wasn't right, like something was there. I had similar experiences and a good amount of occasions, to a point where I couldn't sleep or had insomnia or woke up extremely frightened. Anyway, total silence. Now you may think, well, it was a family member, but why would one be so quiet, not say a word, and on top of that, no one in the bathroom or hallway? That's when it hit me that maybe this not my family member. I had the thought, what the hell is it at the end of my bed? I felt like it was waiting for me to go to sleep, and that this was something I didn't want to do. Then, that family member got out of my bed and went to the restroom. The light in the bathroom, but then that door closed. I felt the end of my bed and it disappeared. Back to what I was saying when I know her presence is in the room. I know because I hear feet sometimes at night time, a heavy gut feeling, a warm sensation on my body, hearing sounds that are very quiet, seeing shadows, hearing things move around my room or my favorite, feeling a hot breathing or grabbing sensation on my body. I let you wonder on that experience, but for now, this one. I was probably eight or nine. I was at summer camp. My cabin, 12 kids led by a counselor and an assistant counselor, were walking in a line by some dunes on the beach along the edge of a temporary stream made by the high tide water running back to the beach. The two counsellors were in the lead, flirting with each other as usual probably, and I was the seventh or eighth kid in line. I was having fun walking right on the edge of the stream and feeling it crumble under my felt feet like sugar. Suddenly, I took a step and more of the edge crumbled than I had thought it would. Both my feet plunged into the stream and immediately sunk through the bottom to about mid-calf. The saturated sand was sticky, like taffy. The water was just above my knee. I tried to take a step, lift my foot out of the sand and go forward. Instead, I sunk a little more. I pumped my feet as hard as I could, but for the life of me, I couldn't get them above the sticky sand again. I could lift each one a little, but with every pull, I sank about an inch lower. I lost more than I gained with every step. Within seconds, I was up to my knees in sand and the water was almost to my hips. I saw the rest of the kids pass by in my peripheral vision until the end of the line was about 10 feet ahead. I realized that I didn't know how to stop sinking and get out. I thought of the word quicksand. Then, before I could get truly scared, I felt strong adult hands under my armpits, brusquely picked me up. And I was lifted and set back down on the firm sand about 18 inches from the crumbled edge. I scampered ahead to the end of the line, assuming some benevolent grown-up had seen me and helped me out. I stayed away from the edge after that, 
I don't want to get in trouble. Only as an adult did, I realised there was nobody else around. The counsellors were canoodling at the front of the line. The kids were all ahead of me. It wasn't a nice day on the beach and there weren't any other people in sight. To my right was a hundred feet of empty beach and to my left was the stream and the dune. So who picked me up? About a year ago, my two children, 16 and 12 at the time, were home alone while I was working. They both said they saw what seemed to be camera flashes coming from outside that entered through all sides of the home's windows. They literally thought there were people outside taking pictures, which to them explained the camera flash. My home was surrounded by woods. I just thought they were scared and were just imagining things even with my own background of seeing multiple spirits when I was a child. This flashing light to me seemed like it wasn't anything paranormal, but it scared my kids and I didn't like that. Then they started experiencing loud bangs on the windows that would wake them up. At this point, I thought we had some peeping Tom that was getting aroused by scaring my kids. So I put a big scary dog and changed my work schedule and everything stopped. Ever since I moved into the home, I felt some kind of presence, but nothing that caused me fear. Of course, I won't tell my kids because I don't want them living in fear. Anyway, just last night at 9.30, my 17 year old and I were watching a show on near death experiences that turned into mediums talking about loved ones and how they show us signs that they're still with us. In my head and just for fun, I thought grandma, if you're here, show me some type of sign. Not really expecting anything to really happen. When suddenly, I saw a very, very bright camera flash that came from the hallway. This light was white, but with a blue colour at the same time. It was so bright and noticeable that if my seven-year-old didn't see it, I would have just thought it was nothing other than some weird eye issue. But when I looked over at her, I could tell she saw it and was questioning it as well. When I asked her if she just saw what she said, Yes, and explained exactly what I had seen. So I got up to try and find the source. Maybe a light bulb burnt out or something. The hallway light was on and so were a lot of other lights in the home which all have a yellow glow. No lights had burnt out. This flash we saw seemed like someone literally to have been in our dining room taking a picture with a flash that landed down the hall and in front of my bedroom door. Our cat was laying in the hallway facing the dining room, seemed completely unfazed by what we'd seen. If there was someone in our home, the cat would have seen them. We would have heard someone, but nothing. My daughter said it was exactly like the flashes of light she and her brother were seeing a year ago. Even though I asked for a sign from my grandmother, I didn't feel this came from her, but instead some other entity just wanted to give me a sign that there is something here with us. So back when I was in university, I lived in a student accommodation, a UK version of dorms. There were six rooms and seven of us. It was my second year and we were all friends who moved in together. We were there for a year and while stuff didn't happen too frequently, we were all talking about it in our group chat the other day. And I've decided to do a little chronological list of all the weird stuff that happened that makes me suspect that our flat may have been haunted which several of my flatmates insisted daily. Some of these I personally witnessed, others I didn't. So first off was an incident that started from Freshers Week and used to happen most days throughout the course of the year. And that's the motion lights turning on, one by one as if someone was walking through them. So the hallway was full of motion lights and they would often flicker and turn on which we fitness witnessed while drinking on freshers nights. Not confirmed activity, could easily be turned up to an electrical malfunction. Next incident was a few weeks in, when the couple who shared the double room, Kyle and Jenny, mentioned that their shower turned on in the middle of the night. Again, unconfirmed as it was pretty hearsay, 
and would also be ex could also be explained as a water malfunction. From here is when things started getting weird. We had a girl called Eve over after a night out. She was sleeping on the couch in the living room slash kitchen area, which was all one. She didn't have a toilet on hand, so needed to use one of the en-suites for our rooms. She opted to use Kyle and Jenny's room as it was closest to the kitchen. After a nighttime toilet trip, she attempted to get back into the kitchen slash living room and apparently couldn't push the door open. She pushed against it hard, but couldn't seem to open this door. She said it was moving slightly, but felt like somebody was pushing against it from the other side. After using an insane amount of force, it flew open and she fell down, banging on Kyle and Jenny's door in tears afterwards. I came out while she was crying and explaining what happened, although in all fairness, she was pretty drunk, so there's a potential explanation. One of the weirdest incidences happened a few months in. Three of us were in the kitchen, myself, Adam and Josh. I had finished cooking and was sitting at the kitchen table eating while watching Josh trying to cook while Adam kept spanking him with a spatula. We were laughing and joking when all of a sudden a coffee pot on the side just seemingly jumped into the air, must have gone up about two feet at least, and slammed against the roof before spilling all over the floor. The three of us were literally speechless. Adam was very skeptical about ghosts and had an explanation for everything prior, but this he struggled to explain. The explanation he's given is that the heat from the cooking caused a pressure buildup underneath the coffee pot, which led to air expansion, causing it to pop in the air. But I'm not as convinced. Another incident experienced by Adam and Josh. They were both watching TV in the living room when apparently the door swung open and slammed really hard to the point that it damaged the wall. Apparently they tried for quite a while with windows open and other doors creating a breeze but couldn't quite mimic the strength and force that this door opened with. Annoyingly, we all got charged with the damage to the wall and it came out of our deposit. Kyle and Jenny reckon that Adam and Josh made that story up because they damaged the walls themselves, play fighting, which they did a lot, and didn't want all the damages just to come out of their deposits. One night, me, Kyle, Jenny, and another girl from a different flat decided to have a movie night where we watched The Room and Birdemic and some other cult classic bad movies. We saw the bathroom light flicker on and Jenny claimed she saw what looked like a shadow of a person moving across the wall into the bathroom. Me and this other girl went into the bathroom and found the light on and sink running. Jenny was the last to use the bathroom and claimed she turned the sink off. Josh, Kyle and Jenny apparently did a Ouija board in the kitchen to communicate with whatever spirit was lingering about. They were the most avid about the flat being haunted. Apparently, they had a conversation with the spirits about it being someone's guardian or something. Josh also apparently spoke to the on-site security who claimed that another student had killed themselves in that flat several years earlier. But again, the story from security and the message they claimed the Ouija board gave didn't really add up. And myself and Adam were quite skeptical that security would just casually tell that story. And I'm also not so convinced with Ouija boards, having done several in the past in locations that are supposed to be extremely haunted, but having no responses. So I'm a bit of a geek and collect a lot of geeky stuff. I had a collection of all the sonic screwdrivers from Doctor Who, which I kept proudly on display. My third Doctor Screwdriver seemingly went missing for weeks and I assumed it was stolen or hidden by either Josh or Leon as us three were in the middle of a flat prank war. One night, my girlfriend and I were in bed when I heard one of my screwdrivers going off. They make a whirring sort of sound when the button is pressed. It sounded like it was coming from under the bed so I looked down under the bed with my torch and saw it right at the back making the whirring sound. The second I touched it, the whirring stopped. I thought something was resting on the button, making, making it make that noise. 
but with this particular screwdriver, you have to pull down the ring. And it just didn't make sense for that to be happening. The last event that we're all aware of happening, if we don't include things constantly going missing, and Josh claiming the TV turned itself on, off, up, down, whenever he was in the room alone, this was me. I connected my Samsung Peel remote to his TV to prank him. And I think Leon was stealing stuff from people's room, explaining things going missing. Another case of me and my girlfriend in my room. She was playing on her Nintendo Switch or DS, I can't quite remember, and I was watching Dragon Ball on the TV. We heard a loud, rhythmic three-tap knock on the window. The curtains were closed, but the sound of knuckles on glass is quite noticeable. I turned off my things and paused for a second. My girlfriend turned to me and said, did somebody just knock on our window? And straight after she said it, we heard the knock again. I immediately opened the curtains but saw nothing. We're six stories up, just to clarify. There was a party going on in the room directly below us, so I wondered if any of them had used a long stick or something and pushed them out of their window as a prank. But they all denied it and told me to ask if anyone was leaning down from the room above. The room above was empty. I have absolutely no explanation for this one and neither does my girlfriend who is a hardcore skeptic. So yeah, that's all the weird stuff that happened in my uni flat. Funnily enough, Leon and another girl that have lived there never had any experiences happen to them. They were all centred around myself, Josh, Kyle, Jenny and Adam. Not sure if that means anything. I wasn't overly convinced of the supernatural prior to living there. But these experiences, as well as a number of stories from my parents, have convinced me to reconsider my beliefs. So this happened like 10 years ago. I was 14 or 15 at the time. I live in France in a regional state called Les Vosges. It's a small mountain slash countryside of France in the northeast near Germany. I was with my cousin today. We were at the same age when we were kids. We did everything together. And that day, there was a big bike competition in my town, like a round of the World Cup of downhill bike. There was the pride of the town during these years. The streets were full, lots of people came from everywhere to see the race, and there were entrances at many spots to go to the centre and along the racetrack. But my cousin and I didn't want to spend any money for an entrance. That was like 20 euros for one. Too expensive for a teenager, as we were. So we had this idea to cut through the forest from my parents' house, which is a little uphill on a mountain, and the track of the race was on the same height. I don't know if I'm clear. We just had to cross this forest on the side of the mountain to arrive along the track and avoid the entrances. I forgot to mention, it was raining like hell this day. Like really strong rain. So we came to walk in this shitty forest, really dense, trees and mud everywhere, all soaking wet. We struggled in this for like 30 minutes when we finally came to a little clear meadow with a house and a dirt road uphill and a second road even more uphill, parallel with a lot of people we could see coming back and forth. My cousin and I supposed that there was an entrance or checkpoint there, because we could hear the speaker from the race. So we decided to take the first dirt road near us, where there were nobody, absolutely nobody. But like, in a weird way, because hundreds of people were uphill, a hundred of meters from us on the other road. So the dirt road go through a little woods, and we know the racetrack was there in a few meters. But it kept making a few turns and at the end of a turn, there was this pile of tree lodges, like six or seven stacks on the side. And I swear, there was this woman sitting on top of that, wearing a long white dress, with her face in her hands like she was crying, and long black hair cover her head. Me and my cousin seen her at the same time and we just froze from fear with goosebumps all in my body. I say again, it was raining so much and a bit foggy, adding even more creepiness. We didn't say anything, but just turned back together to not looking at her as we say, the other road? Yeah. We made our way back and reached the second road with people, 
and saw the race, but we had this woman in mind, like still in shock. I tried to forget her convincing myself that she was just a spectator and she got dumped that day or she was drunk. My cousin and I never spoke about that again, thinking he also forgot. Until one day, maybe four or five years later, we were both at a party in a friend's house and we were a few left, like five in the morning, gathered around a campfire in his garden, talking about stuff. And my friend's stepfather, I don't remember why he was there, started talking about a ghost story that happened to him in a cabin in the forest. So it remained me of the story of the woman that I just told you and told it to my friends and the stepdad. When I finished it, my cousin looked at me angrily and said, you motherfucker, I thought you'd never talk about it again. Like it still leaves a mark on us. There's a bit of woods that's next to a river and past some farmland at the bottom of my estate. It's popular for dog walkers and we recently got a dog at the time this happened. I wasn't there for this story, but I was for the next not tell. They are pretty short. The first one was when my parents walked the dog. The walk takes you to the coast, but they stop by a pretty sandy area. I assume meets some water when the tide comes in enough. They decided to stray from the path to see if there was anything interesting in the woods. They found what my mum described to be a shrine to a woman. Apparently there were some fresh flowers by it, meaning it was apparently visited often by someone. My mum theorised that she had committed suicide, or perhaps died in an accident, when she said she heard a horrible sound. I remember she struggled to describe it to me, and eventually settled on saying it sounded like from a horror movie, where a demon comes up to the screen and bursts into flames. So I assume it was kind of a screeching or screaming. My mum said she felt that she, the woman the shrine was de de dedicated to, really did not want my parents to be there, so they quickly left. The next story, I was there, but I don't think it was very supernatural, but it was creepy. Basically, I was walking the dog with my mum this time instead of my dad. My mum was really unnerved and worried for our dog as we could hear quad bikes nearby and didn't want him to get harmed. At some point, we heard the quad bike right behind us and I remember our dog was off the lead and my mum was having to chase him to the point where I just pretty much commanded her to pick up the dog to prevent him from getting crushed. The man on the bike seemed okay as he passed through. I didn't get bad vibes. However, on the way back, we heard what I would describe as jovial voices in the forest, maybe drunken. I remember my mum was really unnerved as she told me to walk faster and keep up with her and our dog and kept on the lead. We kept looking over our shoulder in case there was someone there with ill intent, but never saw anyone. It was so creepy because that was the first time I'd seen my mum so anxious. This seems like it might fit more on creepy encounters, but it sort of links with the title. These incidents led me to nicknaming the forest the Cursed Forest. I hope you enjoyed reading. I was talking about ghosts recently with my mum, as her side of the family is pretty spiritually sensitive, especially her mum, my nana. I mentioned I only want to move into a new building since it won't be haunted and it's unlikely anyone would have died in it. My mum just looked at me and said, a new build doesn't guarantee it's not haunted. The name of our childhood house was haunt the most haunted house we lived in, and that was only eight years old and no one died in it. I was pretty surprised by this. I don't remember the house very well and asked my mum to explain. My mum said that whenever she was alone, if she was sitting on the sofa that could see into the stairs, she felt very watched. If she moved to the other sofa, it would stop. So it was only ever when she was in the view of the stairs. She also, when she was shutting off for the night, as soon as she turned off the light, she would rush up the stairs because the feeling was very sinister on the stairs. But the feeling would stop as soon as she was in the landing. The sinister watching presence was only ever on the stairs. 
My mum got my nana to come over to see if she could pick anything up, but surprisingly, she didn't notice anything. When we sold the house, my mum was talking to our neighbour, my best friend's mother, and mentioned she always had a funny feeling in the house. So she didn't really mind leaving it. Our neighbour then apparently said, oh yeah, the woman in the house before you used to complain about a sinister spirit on the stairs that made her feel watched. Obviously, my mum was pretty shocked by this, as she thought maybe it was never there since my nana couldn't detect anything. And all my other stories, including the French Nazi ghost brothel hotel story and the other malevolent spirits to do with my mum, were detected by her. So she can obviously sense malevolent spirits. I have plenty of other stories, like the ones mentioned above, as well as a couple about ghosts that give accurate premonitions and accurate psychic readings my mum has had. My grandfather was someone who was always meant for greatness. He left his poor roots in his home country of the Philippines to join the US Air Force and fought in Vietnam to secure citizenship for himself and my grandma and the children they had. He was a man who was tough to be around for a lot of people, including his own family and children. He could be mean and spiteful, but what was known was that I was his baby. He loved me more than he loved anyone else and he would do anything to make me happy, including letting me get a dog when my grandmother was scared of them. He was murdered in 2010, and we didn't know for months due to what happened with his body, but at his funeral, I was the one his family was most concerned about. They told me how he was so proud of me, how he always talked about me. That's just some background. All of my family has concluded that my grandfather comes to us as hummingbirds, and it's funny because after he died, I would go sit on the porch and smoke a cigarette and a hummingbird would zoom in front of me, hover for a few seconds as if staring at me knowingly and then zoom away. This happened so many times. I was the first person in my family he visited in both dream and full apparition form. My uncles, mum and grandmother were pissed, but everyone knew if he would come back, it would be to me first. Anyways, that's all to say that my grandfather is known to be as a hummingbird. My ex and I had a very turbulent, toxic relationship that ended back in August or maybe September. Huge blowouts. Things were awful, but I moved forward. He contacted me a couple times after that, but after one phone call that led me to call the police, I stopped answering any numbers I didn't know. Now, it's mid-November and on Tuesday, I got a letter from my ex. He's in some school to become a rabbi or something, I believe. He was Orthodox Jew when we met and the school is for some religion. I called and confirmed. Anyways, in this letter, he detailed a specific event that I believe is a sign of what I don't know. He said that there was a specific morning that he was lost, broken, dead inside and almost out. He said that during these times, the only thing that kept him going was his undying love for me and the idea that he would see me again. He said on this morning of retribution, he was visited by my grandfather. He said that as he laid there on the ground in the morning sun, a hummingbird came up and hovered for an unusual amount of time. He said it looked at him with knowing eyes. He said my grandfather came to tell him that it was okay to continue loving me. I've not been visited since I received my letter, nor since I sent one back. I should get there any day now if it already hasn't. I wonder what that meant. Why he had visited that ex of all people after what he had put me, us, through. I wonder if that hummingbird was really my grandfather or someone he had lost and the message was misinterpreted. I keep going outside at different times, smoking a cigarette on my stool and waiting for him to come to me. The weather's going to heat up this weekend. I hope it get more than a bird, a dream, a sign, anything. When my ex and I first got together, 
We stayed at his dad's place out in the high deserts of California. Nothing much out there but sand, drugs and old people. His dad's place was a sublet of types. There was a house and I guess what you might call apartments attached. The apartment had a living room, a bedroom, a kitchen and a bathroom, all confined in a tight space. His dad, an older man in his 80s, always slept on the couch. My ex said that's just how it's always been. I've been sensitive to ghosts and the like all my life. My first experience being when I was less than a year old outside the church of my great uncle's funeral, where I alerted my cousin who was holding me to his apparition on the other side of the streets. But that's a story for another time. That place always made me nervous. I knew immediately that something was wrong there. So wrong. In the bedroom, there was enough room for a queen-sized bed. Besides table on either side and a large closet with one of those sliding doors. Since I was a child, I've always had a rule of keeping closet doors closed at night. They were places I often saw things. Especially ones that never walked this earth or were supposed to. I remember this one night specifically. I was laying in bed with my ex and I suddenly felt a panic attack coming on. The weight in the room had shifted. Something was there. And in the dark, the closet door was open. There's a reason for this and I'll circle back to it later. I had always had issues sleeping there, especially near that closet. But that night, I looked into the darkness and I saw something. My breath hiked up in my chest and my ex asked me what I was. I said, I see it. It lives in the closet. I knew something had lived there, but this was the first time it was letting me see it. My ex got silent and then he told me that he believed me. Then he knew something terrible lived in that closet. How it had attached to his father. He said his dad, this man in his mid 80s, would burst in at 2, 3, 4 a.m. and scream and wake him or us up if that closet door was closed. He would fling it back open, storm out and go back to the couch in the living room. He had done this since he moved into the place. I think it's why he slept on the couch. What I saw was not a human or humanoid. It had teeth and cat-like ears and eyes. I could see the teeth glistening, though they were yellow. It was smiling at me. I observed it slowly, trying to breathe and see if it would tell me, tell me anything, what it wanted, who it was working for, how it came to be, anything. I can usually get things to talk to me, but this entity continued to stare and smile. I immediately got out of bed and fled to my car outside. I began texting different friends asking for a tarot reading. I wanted to be told, was it going to hurt me? Was I in danger by staying there? Why has it shown itself to me now? My ex was screaming at me that if I played into it, that if I used pagan ways of handling it, that it would get worse. He was an orthodox Jew. He had his own beliefs, especially about mine. I started to refuse going there, refused staying there, refused everything. My ex and I had a toxic relationship, so it wasn't hard to cut ties in that house. Months passed by and eventually he told me that his dad had suffered a major injury in the house. He had slipped and hit his head. Hit his head so badly he's barely able to function now. He was barely able to function then. His father will probably die alone in that house with the thing in the closet and there's nothing anyone can or will do to save him. His daughter is trying to get him to move in with her, I believe, or was, I don't know. My ex and I have had no contact over the last few months, but I believe that thing in the closet is attached to him, that it's been feeding off of him for so long that even if he moves, it will still be there. I just hope that whatever injury his brain sustained, it's enough to make him not afraid. When I was in high school, my friend called me at 2am. Knowing what an insomniac I was, he assumed I'd be the only one awake when we had to be at school in five hours. He told me that he and his dad had gotten into an argument earlier, before he went to bed. He said his dad always comes to comfort him in his room after they have big fights. 
So when he woke up in the middle of the night and saw the outline of a man sitting on the edge of his bed, he assumed it was his dad that felt bad for yelling earlier. He said, Dad? But the shadow didn't move. He yelled, Dad! And again, there was no movement. So he shook his feet at the end of the bed to move him, or at least hit him with the blanket to get his attention. When the blanket went all the way up, he was worried because that meant there was nothing on the bed. And then he was terrified because the shadow man wasn't there anymore. I figured he was just half asleep and seeing things. I think we've all had that feeling waking up. But he was so scared he left his house and was sitting outside on his porch. He lived in a neighborhood not far from my house. So I said I'd drive over and we'd smoke some weed about it. When I got there, he was visibly shaken. But I got him to calm down eventually and convince him he was seeing things. We smoked a couple blunts and he went inside. While I was leaving, I dropped my lighter and it fell behind me. When I turned around, in the top right window of his house, his room, I saw a man. I thought maybe it was his dad hearing us smoke downstairs, but when I looked closer, it wasn't his dad. Then I thought, oh my God, maybe there's a stranger in the house. And I was freaking out a little bit. But when the man turned to his right, moving more to the center of the window and completely disappeared in front of my eyes. I never told anyone about it, including him, because A, the only person who would believe me would be him and that would only scare him more. People, people would just say, oh, you were high. Why would we believe that? I had a pretty high tolerance in high school and anyone who smoked weed knows it's not gonna make you see a man in a window for over 15 seconds. Two years ago, we were at my friend's house in Salt Lake City. There was a group of about 10 of us and we were just hanging out and kicking back sober. One of our friends suggested we should play sardines, I think. It's the game where one person hides and everyone else has to go find them, you know? Anyways, she got really weird, really fucking fast. So we have this friend, we'll call her Lexi in this story. We began to play sardines and one of my friends went deep into hiding in the home. The rest of us began searching. So a couple minutes in, I'm walking down a dark hallway and I'm near the beginning of it. And Lexi leaves the bathroom at the midway point of the hallway and begins walking down the hallway away from me. She didn't see me as she left the bathroom and I just watched. Here's where shit gets weird for me. As she's walking down the hallway, she stops for a second, slightly glitches in and out, kind of like this scene in Rick and Morty. She also became pixelated as she glitched back in. She made a distinct 90 degree left turn that looked super robotic and unnatural and entered the room on the left. When I watched her do this, I felt sick to my stomach as if I'd seen something I definitely wasn't supposed to do. It was like I was watching a Sims character moving. It freaked me the fuck out. The weird thing is, she didn't know I was watching her, which makes it freakier. She was alone, or so she thought, and that's what made me feel sick to my stomach. We were all completely sober, by the way. I don't know what to make of this experience, but it scarred me for life. I actually had a little crush on her, but after that moment, I never could feel she was a conscious living being. It's so fucked up the way I said that, but it's true. She makes me feel uneasy. My conscious adventure with trees began about three years ago. Then I found the book entitled Conversations with Trees by Veronica Dabrowska. After reading it, my world was turned upside down. The knowledge that the trees passed on in this book was something I had never encountered before. At that time, I had the impression that the secret of life, the ancient knowledge of our existence, was being revealed to me. Fascinated by what I've just discovered, I started to go to the forest and look for contact with trees. My girlfriend and I started hugging one of the birches, who was the first to call us. Since we didn't know how such a contract takes place, at the beginning we just cuddled up to the tree or sat down by it. Over time, we started to feel the energy of the tree more and more clearly, 
its intentions and contact have become more and more conscious. Trust in what we have left turned out to be crucial here. About a year ago or so, I took part in the workshops with two people who teach this form of communication in my country. What I experienced there was on a completely different level. Since then, my contact with trees has taken on a completely different, deeper dimension. However, the fact that the trees have asked me to support and write this text, writing it to you, is something I'm experiencing with these beings for the first time. And the trees are very, very keen to get people back to nature, to so start talking and working with it. But started from the beginning, about a month ago, for a reason that wasn't known to me at the time. I started watching YouTube videos showing nature in the United States, many national parks. I was very drawn to it. I couldn't get away from these films and I could look at the beauty of nature that's manifested throughout your entire continent for several hours a day. I felt an unspeakable longing for these places, for contact with the local nature. But why? Since I've never been there, not in this incarnation. Once life has taught me everything happens for a reason, everything has a purpose and everything leads us somewhere, only then I realized that it was not only my longing, but also the longing from the earth, the longing from nature, the longing from trees, the longing for us, for people who live so far away, living asleep, in their illusions of systemic life, unaware of who they really are and why they came here. And that's where the story of that post begins. I've already mentioned to you that there are two people in Poland who teach communication with trees. The people are Sebastian Srebcza and Veronika Dabrowska. I noted about Veronika. She's written a book about talking to trees. She's already published two volumes and Sebastian has lived to see his book. All these publications are in Polish, but from several months, Veronika passes the first volume of her textbook translated into English. It is a working translation so far, but the book will be published next spring. But today, on behalf of Veronica, I would like to make the excerpt from this book available to you. You'll find the link to the download below. That's what the forest asked me to do when I was on a walk about a week ago. At that time, a very strong desire to write this post apprehended and appeared in me, as well as the urge to write to Veronica with a request for the book who apart from making fragments of her book available, has written a few words from herself. And there, a message from the trees themselves appeared in me. A message for you. Although it's still a little difficult for me to go out into the world with this knowledge, I was so pushed to it that I knew there was no turning back. So, so I'm there, and that's what I'm writing. In all this, it also led by an almost 100-year-old oak tree which is situated near me, named Helen, who for some reason didn't want to be left out there. Thank you, brother. So underneath, I put what the trees want to tell you and the message from Veronica about the language of the trees. The trees love us. They see us as their brothers and sisters, and they're very keen to live with us consciously. The trees point out that this is a very important message and talk about seeing or discovering the depth of these words. Call. You are conscious because you were born by a conscious. You are nature because you were born by a nature. You are the earth because you were born from the earth. Everything is conscious because everything is a consciousness. Everything is connected because everything is one. Everything has a spirit, feel its call and go back where you came from. We see your thoughts, we hear your words. Come to us, we call you, our camaraderie of experience. We need each other more than ever. If reading our words you feel a longing for a forest, you feel the need to meet nature. Do not hesitate, follow the voice of your heart. We're waiting to remind you of your connection with the source. We're waiting to heal you. We're waiting to lead you out of the illusion of separation. Open yourself to our coexistence, and this will open the way to the end of what you call suffering. I have to add a few more things to the message. First of all, 
Trees are like people. They feel emotions like us. They have feelings. They're conscious and they communicate with each other and with the world. They have an observational nature. If anyone has doubts about trees as conscious beings, I refer to a typical scientific research book, Secret Life of Trees by Tita Wallaban, a wonderful book. As for the communication itself, if one of you, while reading this text, felt the urge to make contact with trees, the matter is simple. Just go for a walk in the forest, walk around the area where the trees go, go out with the intention of contact. The tree that wants this contact will call you, will attract your attention. You'll be driven to this tree. Sometimes you can also have the impression that a tree even appears to us in the forest. It stands out from other trees. It's that feeling. Such a tree can rustle with leaves to summon us. It works perfectly when it's windless and no other tree acts in that way. The tree can even call you through birds. When you're familiar with this experience, it will be more and more interesting with time. The contact does not have to appear immediately. When you express your intentions, it can sometimes take a couple walks before that tree appears in your space. And when that happens and you come to such a tree, move your consciousness into the space of your heart. Open up to feeling. Feel the energy of the tree. You can either hug or sit under the tree and lean back. Do as you feel. Don't expect a big deal out of this. Of course, these experiences are magical, but they're both ordinary and natural, like everything else you do. And they will become so over time. While you're by the tree, watch what appears in your space, in your interior. Watch your thoughts and feelings. Through, though them trees can speak to us, most of these contacts are subtle experiences and require sufficient attention to capture them. What we think or feel by the tree may be a message from it. Very often, you can just feel the peace and quiet, which with a period of time can turn out to be a very deep cognition. The trees won't always talk, but they will often just work with you. Actually, they usually do. And more precisely, clean up your energy field. Then we just feel like we're just sitting there. Some people cry under a tree, while others experience the ecstasy or a beautiful joy of existence. It's all very individual. Another thing that's important is the questions. If you feel like asking them, do it. The answers can come immediately or only after time and in various forms. Trust what comes to you. Tell the tree about yourself, your life, your problems. This also opens up communication links. Solutions to these problems may come to you at any given moment or later. Of course, there may be more intense or even mystical experiences, such as putting the tree into the theta state and visions combined with the messages. But from my experience, I know that this doesn't happen very often. I've only experienced this a few times myself, but it's my experience. For someone else, it may be much more often. The range of experiences is actually unlimited, and over time, new forms of experiencing this communication appear. What Sebastian and Veronica sometimes experience is often beyond my comprehension. Remember that communication with trees is a skill that each of us has, but because we have forgotten about it, we have to learn it anew like any other language. It all depends on your openness. The more internally ready you are for this contact, the faster it will appear. It's also good to go in a group. It may intensify the contact. And last but not least, your heart's voice. There's your navigation. Follow the voice of your heart and what you feel and it will guide you like no one else. Your soul lives on your heart. Ask it to lead and open up to it. Trust your inner tuition. Do what you feel and you don't need any external navigation. So much for me. Thank you. Let's reunite with nature. There is presented below a message from Veronica Dabrowska. Talking to trees. The trees are creatures that have within them the memory of the dawn of the earth, the time when the earth was created, the source codes from which it was created, the memory of the basic matrix. 
The conversation with the tree is simple because it's enough to remove the, from consciousness the conviction specific to human modern civilization that apart from people, other beings are conscious and communicate. The basis for the knowledge of correct communication is cosmic physics and knowledge of the elements. The material version of our world is a frozen structure. It vibrates at the level of beta waves of the human brain, which is the transmitting and receiving antenna. The central management point of a living being is the place in the heart, in the third heart ventricle, in a measurable point with a temperature of several thousand degrees and a strong electromagnetic field called the inner sun. Every living creature has this point. It's responsible for the consciousness and memory of the being and the physical form that it displays in a specific reality as a hologram. Trees are creatures with, different than human, specialized in their task physical bodies. Apart from the structure of the hologram of matter, there are only creatures in soft plastic darkness from which everything is made. Humans create at the beta wave level. Communication with the trees takes place on delta slash theta waves, where there are plasma thread connections between creatures. The stronger the electromagnetic field of the inner sun is, the more these threads create more and more durable. Through the plasma threads, information flows in both directions, increasing the size of the thread and thus increasing the electromagnetic field of the heart. We call it love. It's an element that fills the entire universe. Communication with the trees reminds us of the correct cosmic information exchange. The trees communicate with each other through these threads. The truth about the universe flows to us through the trees. The older the tree is, the more complex the communication on the space level is. The human brain decodes this information as it's also receiving aerial information. I invite you to communicate at the level of heart coherence.